Welcome to Fellowship Safaris, conversations about people of color and their journeys to subspecialist training in their countries of origin and around the world. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fellowship Safaris. I am your host, Jenny Kaya Jahe. I am really, really excited to be having the next guest because she is a person who I got to know and become a really good friends with during my fellowship journey. And I think her fellowship journey and her pediatrics journey is quite unique and also really special and beautiful. Hi everyone, um, my name is Maria Conagero. I am a pediatrician, um, currently living in Chile. Um, I did a fellowship in pediatric hospital medicine and I just finished a couple of months ago, so I'm excited to be here. Why did you pick pediatrics, Maria, as your place of specialization to begin with? So I, I had a great experience when I did PEDS, but when I, when I was in med school, I thought that PEDS was boring because PEDS was just cold and healthy people. And I was into medicine and I liked physiopathology. I liked to understand the processes of people getting sick and kids were not getting sick. And I did well with kids and I had fun with them, much mm-hmm. more fun than the one that I had with adults. And I had the opportunity to do a, a rotation in a very complex service, which is where I actually work now. And I knew then a complexity on, of pediatrics that I hadn't known before. So that's why I decided to come into PEDS. But I never liked the, the, like the outpatient clinics. I liked the inpatient, the very sick kids, because that was the same as internal medicine, but with funnier patients. It's great to know that you've always been sort of like a medical detective, as it were. Why pediatrics hospitalist fellowship? Like, what's that? Well, it's a fellowship that is it's not an old fellowship. It, it was actually just recognized as a subspecialty in 2016 by the AAP. People, kids have been getting sick and being admitted to the hospital since forever. But we, we always extend that pediatric hospitalist care to what a generalist, like a general pediatric pediatrician should do. But particularly in the past, like 20, 30 years, the hospital medicine has become much more complex. We have more kids that are of high complexity, which develop complex issues that need to be admitted. There is a science around using resources, wisefully stewardship, of resources and optimizing processes. And particularly in that niche is where pediatric hospital medicine appeared as a need. The term hospitalist started in a New England Journal of Medicine article. It quickly expanded into pediatrics because it's it's the same problems that we face. It's, it's a subspecialty. It's um, a bundle of expertise that you need. What was your process like and how did you land on the country? to do your subspecialty? When I graduated from residency, I wasn't sure what I wanted. I liked everything. I knew that I liked complexity. So I liked disciplines that had to do with the hospital care. I was thinking about PQ or cardiology, endocrine, but with a focus on the inpatient setting. And then my first year after residency, I worked a lot. I did NICU calls. I had an outpatient clinic and I also worked as a hospitalist. I had a lot of support from the leadership here in in the center where I work. Uh, And they were the ones that started like putting the seed on me about like maybe thinking about a pediatric hospitalist as a discipline. We don't have a formal fellowship in my country here. So they were like, you should consider. And I started to like leave the other things and give more time to my hospitalist work and that's where I decided to like actually pursue a fellowship because I work in a very complex uh, hospital it's it's a tertiary tertiary hospital here and I work with subspecialties and I felt that 
I needed to empower myself with more knowledge to be able to give the care that my patients needed. I started doing research and the place where I did my fellowship offers a wide variety of general peds fellowships. And that's why I started looking into that particular center. I knew a couple of doctors that had already done their fellowships there. So, so I was familiar with how the hospital worked and how good the training there was. When you were making the decision to leave the country, did you make that decision you know, on your own or did you have any other factors to consider when you were now thinking of pursuing the fellowship out of, out of your home country? I thought about it a lot. I, I love my life here, but I also wanted to have an adventure. So I decided on my own that I wanted to pursue a fellowship. But I think that that was something very important. I, at the time, um, was in a relationship when I was my husband. And I had this plan brewing in my mind when we started dating, that I might go, I might go out for a couple of years to pursue a fellowship. And he was a support. We had a conversation because we were already living together. And it was like, okay, I'm doing this. I want to do this. I'm going to do this. But if I do it, and you want to come with me, it's not going to be my decision. It's going to be the decision of us as a couple. And I think we had that conversation very early on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that was very helpful. It was never, I am going with you to pursue a fellowship that you wanted. It was, yeah. we are deciding to go abroad into this adventure. Funding is usually a really big barrier and a big challenge. So what was the funding stream going to look like for you with this particular fellowship? So I'm very lucky. When I did the submission of my CV, I had a wish that I got funding from the, the institution where I was going to do fellowship, but I knew that that was hard. So I had two backup plans because I am very organized. Uh, my backup plan A was to get some funding from the institution where I was currently working, which is the institution where I work now. And plan C was for me to try to organize some sort of funding out of like some organizations. And I, I thought about some organizations, but I say I was lucky because I was offered funding from the program. And that was amazing because it actually gave me freedom, to, the freedom to to look for a good job and like, put myself more freely into, into like the conditions overall. I think that funding is absolutely something that you should consider when you're thinking about fellowship because it's hard. You're absolutely right. It gets so tricky, especially when you're going to a new country. It's a new place and everything is just, everything just costs a lot more than you would have expected in your home country. During the time when you had gone for your fellowship, had they assured you of a job once you'd be done? I was offered a leave of absence for the two years. So they maintained my conditions when I came back. I had a job secured. And, and that also gave me some like, peace of mind. What was the experience like? What was the actual fellowship experience like for you? I think it was amazing. It was great. But it was also one of the hardest things that I've done academically. I worked as a hospitalist for two and a half, three years before I went to fellowship. After I graduated residency, so I knew how the work was done. The patients that I see here are, are very complex and in the complexity similar to the ones that I did, uh, that I saw where, where I did my residency. But I hadn't grasped how hard it is not to be on the system that you know, not to be with the people that you know, to start like start from zero, literally, where here I, I trained, I did my medical school in one one university and then I did my residency in another hospital and from another university. But still, even though they were different systems, it's the same country. It's the same law. It's the same jurisdiction. Policies, like national policies, are kind of the same. You speak the same language with your patients even. So when I got there and I had to get in touch with it, this new system, not only like the system, like how the flows are, but like how you ask for things, how you work, how you 
talk to patients, how you talk to parents, how you are supposed to like write a comfort note. Everything was so different that that it was it was now that I look back to that, it was all learning. But that was the hard piece. It wasn't the, the academic piece because I loved knowing and reading. It was that piece that was very hard. Now that I look mm-hmm. back, look back, I think that mm-hmm. me and, and my husband, we were very crazy because we never we had never been to Canada. We knew nothing. And we just yeah. like decided that we were going to live there for two years. And yeah. I have to thank you, Jerry, because in that journey you were uh, you were oh. there, like saying, <laughs> telling me, "Hey, this is like this, this is like that." I had no one at the beginning, no one else. You you start knowing no one. You don't know yeah. the nurses, you don't know the lingo. Everything was hard at the beginning, and it it was easier after. But but still, yeah. everything was every day. I learned something new. That code switch, learning how they talk, learning how they do things, was also so difficult, even for me, and just trying to figure out. Wait. We are speaking English. And I know sometimes we'd both be on call and we're like, wait, we are both speaking English. Why are they not understanding us? Or why is the situation <laughs> not clear? How challenging was it for you? Because I know you're primarily a Spanish speaking individual and you also speak English very fluently. How was the language shift for you? I developed some strategies. I had some templates that I, I worked on. I also checked my spelling all the time but still everyone sometimes they they, they laughed because I, I had some words that I often misspelled and they were like oh this note is Maria and they were very nice with that but it, it was hard um, and I, I always made fun of myself being a snail but I accepted myself as that because for me it was harder it took more time mm-hmm. to write a note I had to double check I had to uh, check the spelling all the time the grammar It wasn't a natural process as it was for me when I worked in my country. How was that experience for you being in a new place and being given leadership opportunities together going hand in hand with your learning? I think it was a great experience. I learned so much from being able to take that that leadership role. I am very, very grateful for that. But I would want to disclose that I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have taken that role if I wasn't doing that role with a friend. I did that with one of my friends from fellowship. We we were co-leaders in this role. And then when my friend finished her rotation, like her her fellowship and I was supposed to step in, they then another friend filled in her position. So I was always I always had my backup and I always had a good backup. I think that that was key for me. And I think that that is one of the greatest things of fellowship. You are able to make friendship with people that have similar interests academically, but also people that might work similar or different from the way you work, but you Mm -hmm. learn from that. And that's that's amazing. You explained that before coming into fellowship, you had some people that worked under you and you you were teaching and, and mentoring. How was that shift from being a a teacher, leader, mentor and transitioning to being a student? Because I think a lot of pediatricians come from leadership roles or very senior roles in their countries and sort of have to shift into that fellow role. I think that that was hard first because I wasn't used to fellowship, like the fellowship figure in in the pediatric hospitalist world so so that intermediate role of not being a resident but not being the staff it's it's hard and I didn't have like I didn't have a model before I got to my fellowship the program gave me some time to adjust and I started like buddy calling and doing some buddy shifts and and I got to know, like understand what was the position that I was supposed to be feeling in and then there were some pros and cons about being a student again. When when you're the staff, people look to you in 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 everything that you do, and that that can get stressing. So so that was something like some sort of like mental load that that lifted when I went back to being a student. The hard piece is that you get used to being the one that decides. Like 
we do this or we don't. Yeah. And in a fellowship, sometimes there are decisions that that eventually the staff has to decide and you might think differently. So I learned that and I used that framework to understand the role and not to get frustrated when I was discussing something and some sort of plan and then the the staff that I was working with hypothetically said, no, I would rather do something differently. I I used Mm -hmm. that framework to, to frame these decisions. It's not that what I was suggesting was wrong. It's just that grays are gray. And I think that I, I had to often go back to this idea that, that mm-hmm. grace, grace are good. And, and that's why when I was the staff, I had, it was a trade-off. I decided, yeah. which feels good, but then it's a responsibility. Mm-hmm. And since most of the things are in this gray area, it's part yeah. of what I went there to learn in the, in the like, ultimately, that, that's the thing that I want to learn. It's so interesting that you figured out a gracious way to be able to navigate it because there's so many people who struggled because part of postgraduate training or specialist training is to hone that skill of being able to make decisions, taking responsibility for decisions, and continuing to have that confidence as you make clinical decisions. And then to shift from that to you are now a learner, somebody else has that responsibility, and so you don't work as independently as you did before shifting your mindset into that sort of like learning and growth mindset it doesn't sound like it was easy however it sounded it sounds like you you figured out a balance for it somehow when you're thinking about pursuing a fellowship especially if you already had some experience working as a staff Mm -hmm. you have to really embrace that experience it's going to be a learning experience and the learning comes from things that you might not anticipate are there things that stick out in your mind as highlights of your fellowship definitely i think that being able to connect with so like such a wide variety of like people places like people that come from different places that that was amazing and we learn from that i think that the fact that I was actually able to get into this system that i had never been before and and actually like provide good care and learn and be valued uh, like ha- like be be like appreciated by my colleagues there that's great and i remember patients i remember conversations and every day when i am now here in Chile doing my job i put in some pieces and i always laugh with my with my colleagues here and i'm like mm-hmm. oh I ha- i'm going to say it again i'm going to say it again in mm-hmm. fellowship, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and they laugh. And yes. they laugh about that. <laughs> yes, because there's 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 so much, so much that you learn, and yeah. I am so grateful for for being able to have had that experience. And are there moments that you consider were lows? Sometimes the issue of being in a system that you don't know and not having your network because you develop a network. It's not that I didn't have, but but you're not in your network. It's like you're developing a network. And the experiences might be hard when you have a bad day, which of course everyone has. It's hard to be alone. Talking with other, with my other fellows, we we felt that need of, of connecting. I have to disclose that I did my fellowship the first year was was in the pandemic. So so right. meeting was mm. was a, a huge issue. So we felt that need of connection and, and building a community. So we, with my other co-fellow, uh, we, we started to develop a group of, grow, a, a small group of a community of practice mm-hmm. in our fellowship to fill that gap. What is one thing that you can do or recommend that would make the system much easier, like a, a much softer landing for international graduates who are coming into a whole new medical system, a new information system, and having to do that alongside learning. I think that this podcast, Jerry, and talking to people, and I, I like that this is a, a, like a podcast where you can actually like hear a conversation. Mm. It's so much, it, it's of so much value. I think that the fact that my family was full in and mm. full in with my cat and my dog 
included. Yeah. I think that that was great. And my husband was my support system. He was the primary person that, that actually helped me in my daily things. Like, for example, hey, you know what? Oh, no, I forgot this important document at home. Don't worry, I'll bring it to you. That tiny aspects of life yeah. that when you're alone in a country get very tricky if you don't have that network. I am a huge advocate of mental health. I, I did therapy before and I continued my therapy throughout fellowship. I think mm -hmm. that it's something that you should do if, if you feel the need. I would encourage everyone to like, just it's it's just like a checkup. You should do it if you need it. And, and if you don't, that's, that's fine, but it's good to talk to someone. Some experiences might be hard. I, I had some... I had support and I know that there are systems. You have to ask for them. Uh, it's good that you are, that today we're in a, in a place where, where no one would look back at you for saying, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? I needed to take some time and, and mm -hmm. that's good. I think that, that's, that, that the resources are there. So, so it's, it's, it's good. When you go into an institution, it's something that if you need, you should ask for it. Being able to talk to someone and, and mm -hmm. like say, you know what? Like, see it from these angles and, it, and it's good and I also mm. meditate and um, do yoga having something that helps you stay grounded to remember that you're not just a fellow you you have much much more layers that yeah. make you be who you are because fellowship has such you know it's so rigorous for people who have had mental health concerns sometimes just the rigor of the fellowship can be triggering I really appreciate Maria being very open about that and, and sharing that. So thank you so much, Maria, for sharing that. I know that you are an avid reader and you loved reading books. What were some of the books that you enjoyed reading during fellowship and were impactful for you during fellowship? When I, when I read this question, I was like, this is not going to be what Jerry wants me to say. <laughs> I read a lot, but yes. I'm going to be very honest. <laughs> I read romantic Victorian com uh, novels. I wanted to rest my brain and lean yes. into nice dresses, love stories, kisses, yes. and all oh. that stuff. Are there other things that you did or you and your husband did that you enjoyed that were, helped you relax and explore? I want to emphasize how important for me was yoga. Yoga teaches you that sometimes you're not in control, even though you do your best, even mm. though you, the day before, were able mm. to, I don't know, get into that very weird posture. Mm -hmm. The next day it might be different and you might not do it because your body's different, your mind is different. And that thing that I learned from yoga applied a lot to fellowship. You know, Jerry, I also was able to be part of my re my religious community. I'm, I'm a Catholic, so I always pray. And I think that, of course, you get a lot of strength from from asking for, from, for help from someone above you. So I think that that was also mm. something that definitely made me stronger and, and more hopeful when, when things were hard and also grateful when things were good. Do you have any regrets when you think back on your fellowship experience? I think that one of the things that I would want to do differently if I went back to the fellowship, which I, um, please, husband, I'm not thinking about that. I would want to take more time to travel through the country. What would be your word of wisdom to somebody who's thinking about doing a fellowship? I would say that it is hard and don't underestimate me. It's harder than you think. But I would say that being able to have this training is worth it. You should have a good conversation with your support system so that they really know that they will have to support you. They are going to be, they're going to have to be there. And sometimes it's going to be that they're going to have to be there and you're not going to be there for them because the intensity of the work is, is, is huge and you have to be in the hospital. And having that clear and if you have a support system that, that's willing to go with you and, and support you, I, I would say have that like growth mindset 
and like have it as a mantra because it's like the learnings are gonna come in ways that you won't expect it. I would say that in the end, it's all gonna be worth it. In your understanding, what is the growth mindset and why is it so important? Growth mindset, it's a broad term, but I would wanna like put it into context. We we're never done learning. We are never done being the best that we are because we, we can improve every day in everything that we do. And that sounds that sounds super cool, but that has another side. That means that you're going to not be great sometimes and that you are going to make mistakes. That's going to be hard. You are not going to be fulfilling some expectations. It's either the job, uh, with your family, with your friends. Because when you when that happens is where you're when you're able to like grow actually. That's really well said, Maria, and that's so beautifully put that it's not just for fellowship. And I think it's really important to have that growth mindset when you're going into fellowship, but then taking it a step further and actually applying it in your day to day life, especially for us as doctors, because we are really, a lot of us are perfectionists. Like we want to do things and we want to do them perfectly all the time. So it's really refreshing to hear that you are constantly working on being kinder to yourself. Thank you once again, Maria, for joining us. I know because of the time difference, it's pretty early on your end. Thank you. I'm so glad you stayed tuned. Please get the word out and share it with at least three people. Make this episode like a chain letter. Share it, share it, share it. Come back for the next leg of our safari where we'll be talking about... Fellowship is is not just uh, the studying part. I feel like um, it's a chance to also... It gave me a chance to reconnect with who I am. I got married right after internship and then I became a mother immediately. I had dated my husband from second year of medical school. So I sort of not forgot, but uh, it was nice to have time to um, remember who I was before all the titles. And so the regret was I I didn't spend more time exploring. I I was too focused on work and and maybe it would have been a, a more richer experience if I took a bit more time to have a bit more fun. But I, I don't regret the experience itself. The learning itself was great. And yeah. It takes a village to make this podcast. Strategic and creative direction was done by Josephine Karianjahe and Melissa Mbogwa. The producer of the show is Melissa Mbogwa. Tevin Sudi is the sound engineer with thanks to AQ Studios. The graphic design was done by Benjamin Boyer. And the original music was done by husband extraordinaire Mwakavi Mawewu. This is an Africa Podfest production.